My name is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I am a Nigerian writer and I'm here in Amsterdam to talk about um, the stories that Europe tells itself about its colonial history. So when my agent forwarded an invitation from the European Cultural Foundation and from the University of Amsterdam, I was surprised. It was not the usual invitation to speak about literature or writing or about something that usually would have African in it. This time the invitation was to speak about Europe. And so my first thought was that there was some mistake. I'm represented by a very big agency and it's not altogether unthinkable that they might have forwarded mistakenly an invitation meant for another writer, somebody with a more obvious connection to Europe. So I was puzzled by the invitation, but I was also immediately interested. I know nothing about Europe and I thought, what better thing to talk about than that which you know nothing about? But more seriously, Europe is foreign to me. Of course, being a reader and lover of books, I have encountered Europe through literature, but the practical reality of Europe is foreign to me. I'm a person born and raised in Nigeria. I was educated in Nigeria and in the United States. And while I consider Nigeria home now, I spend half my time in Nigeria and the other half in the United States. And I've been fortunate enough to travel quite a bit because I'm fortunate enough to earn my living as a writer. And, <clears throat> and, and, in, and I get invitations of this sort. And in accepting these invitations, I often spend a day or two or three longer in different parts of the world just so that I can smell the air in those places. And I've done that in Europe, in Denmark, in Norway, in Sweden, in Ireland, in Italy, in Finland, France, Belgium, Germany, and even here in Holland. Those visits were too short, too transitory. But of course, I also formed opinions, as one generally does. I remember, for example, that there was an unwelcoming stillness in the air in the city of Stuttgart, which was quite different from the altogether more salutary air of Stockholm. I particularly remember immigration officials at European airports, because my Nigerian passport invariably brings about some reaction. And so, as I approach an immigration official in Europe, I am always slightly tense. In Copenhagen, the officer assumed I was a prostitute when I produced my passport. And he kept asking, are you sure you're a writer? As though, as though to give me a chance to recant and confess that I really was a prostitute. And it turned out that at the time there had been an influx of Nigerian sex workers to, to Denmark, apparently. Uh, in Frankfurt, the officer asked if I was a flight attendant. Otherwise, why did I travel so often? He asked, flipping through the visas in my passport. And perhaps in his mind, people who looked like me were conceivably flight attendants, but not conceivably writers. In France, the officer was polite and friendly. I told him I was a writer in Paris for a few days, and he smiled and said, welcome to France. And I, so unused to this, felt inordinately grateful to have been believed. I will always remember that immigration official in Paris. I was also thrilled to be in the country whose language I have for very long and rather predictably found beautiful. But the other thing I will remember about Paris is that a day into my stay, a woman originally from Cameroon interviewed me, and when I asked what life was like for her in Paris, I was startled by the fury of her discontent. These people, she said often, these people. Now, England, I have always seen as a little different, and, and I think indeed, I suppose England sees itself as a little different. I have English friends who talk about the Europeans. But my view of England has to do, I think, with being an Anglophone West African, of having a contested and complicated relationship with the country that colonized, indeed created, mine. England is familiar and exotic at the same time. In England, or perhaps I should say in London specifically, I feel an instant familiarity, although of course that is not the case, for example, in a town like Bath, which is pleasant and pretty, but not where I could imagine myself living happily as I sometimes do of London. And so in accepting the invitation to come here, I had continental Europe in mind, a place about which, as I said earlier, I know very little. <laughs>
To be in Europe is for me to be submerged in cloudy water. I watch, I observe, but often I am aware that there are nuances whose meanings bypass me. Nuances that I'm simply unable to grasp, or as an American would say, I don't get it. But this not getting it is normal for a person like me who is looking in from the outside. And from that outsider's perspective, there are things that strike me about Europe. I am fascinated by the tribalism in Belgium, in Switzerland, in Spain, but of course one must not call it tribalism. There's a language for saying these things, certain words reserved for certain parts of the world, and I will return to language later. I am incredulous that France has spent so much political energy on a few women who cover their faces, but I am interested in the underlying discomfort, a discomfort bordering on hostility that Islam faces in France and the rest of Europe. I am amused that the European Union is often like a collection of cousins who deeply dislike each other but have to pretend to be nice at the dinner table. But most of all, the single thing about Europe that has most interested me in recent years is a speech the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, delivered in Dakar, Senegal in 2007. It was a, it was a famous speech, at least judging by how many people forwarded it to me by email. And I would like to use that speech as a basis to talk today about the stories that Europe likes to tell itself about its colonial history. And I should say that by <clears throat> colonial history, I mean it's colonial history in Africa, since, not surprisingly, that is what interests me. It is perhaps a little unfair to focus on that speech, because I am almost certain that Sarkozy is not the most popular politician in Europe, and that many do not agree with his positions. And of course, one must generalize and say Europe, even though Iceland does not have France's colonial history. But let us pretend that these cousins who do not necessarily like each other are all beneficiaries of the same colonial history. Sarkozy's speech offended many Africans and perhaps some Europeans as well. But it seems to me that it is a speech we, which, beneath its condescending and arrogant language, beneath its hubris, articulated ideas that are mainstream in Europe. So let me start with a story about a Nigerian woman who is married to a Belgian and has lived there for many years. She said once that she was shocked that her son, while being taught Belgian history, was taught nothing about Congo. She said, they teach my son in school that he must help the poor Africans, but they don't teach him about what Belgium did in Congo. Of course, all countries are evasive about the pasts for which they feel ashamed, but I was struck by what seemed to me not to be just evasiveness, but an erasure of history. If her son does not learn that the modern Congo state began 100 years ago as a personal property of a Belgian king who was desperate to get wealthy from ivory and rubber, if her son does not learn that the hands of Congolese people were chopped off for not producing enough resources to meet a king's greed, if her son does not learn that the Belgian government later ruled Congo with a deliberate emphasis on not producing an educated class so that Congolese could become clerks and mechanics but they could not go to university. If her son does not learn that more recently, even though it was the Americans who installed the Mobutu <coughs> Uh, dictatorship, Belgium was a major force behind the scenes propping him up. If this young Belgian boy knows nothing of these incidents, then at some point they will perhaps no longer have happened, because the past, after all, is the past because we collectively acknowledge that it is so. This young Belgian boy will grow up to see Africa only as a place that requires his aid, his help, his charity, with no complications for him a place that can help him show how compassionate he can be, and most of all, a place whose present has no connection to Europe. It is not that Europe has denied its colonial history. Instead, Europe has developed a way of telling the story of its colonial history that ultimately seeks to erase that history. The language of this story is friendly, in the manner of a tough talking friend, a person telling truths that just simply must be told. As Sarkozy starts his speech with these words, I have come to talk to you with the frankness and sincerity that one owes to friends that one appreciates and respects. I appreciate and respect Africa and the Africans.
The society that neglects to teach the Belgian boy about Congo also, I am sure, feels this friendship for Africa. It is a society that wants to help, and so it teaches the child that Africa is a place that needs his charity. Of course, few will quarrel with the idea of a child being encouraged to help those in need, and there are many, many people in need in Congo and elsewhere in Africa. But why is there also this erasure of the past? Conrad, who would know a bit about the subject, having traveled on the Congo River, called Belgium's actions in Congo the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the human conscience. Why is the boy not taught about the European atrocities in Congo? Perhaps we can find the answer from Sarkozy's speech. Shortly into that speech, Sarkozy says, I have not come to deny mistakes or crimes. Mistakes were made, crimes committed. But no one can ask of the generations of today to expiate this crime perpetrated by past generations. No one can ask of the sons to repent for the mistakes of their fathers. Sarkozy also says, colonization is not responsible for all the current difficulties of Africa. It is not responsible for the bloody wars between Africans, for the genocides, for the dictators, the fanaticism, the corruption, the prevarication, the waste and the pollution. And so this, perhaps a little bluntly put, is central to the story that Europe tells itself about its colonial history. It is a story that basically says, yes, colonialism happened, but, and whatever comes after the but is the focus of the story. The but is crucial. The second part of the story is much more emphasized than the first. Shortly after my first novel was published, I would do public readings outside Nigeria and often be asked or even be told that my novel was a political allegory, that my abusive father character represented Nigeria's brutal dictator. Why, I wondered, must my character somehow represent something political? Why must I always have words like sociopolitical linked to my work? Why am I not asked about the interpersonal relationships between the characters, about love, about passion, about resentment, about hope and envy, about the personal motivations of the characters? Obviously, I know the reasons. The modern African novel has its roots in the anti-colonial struggle, and there's so little African writing that is known outside Africa that the easy response is always to read it as some sort of native explanation of an unknown place that it is almost impossible for a Nigerian novel to be read first as a story of human beings before being read as an allegory of a political situation. But it does not change the truth, which is that when I sat down to write the abusive father character, I was not thinking, I shall now write an important allegorical representation of my country's military culture. Instead, I was going through what I like to call the magic and craft process. Of creativity. I was keen simply to tell a human story about a particular man with a particular history. Yet, because I have become used to being expected to explain my country, because I am myself not uninterested in politics, I decided to invent a sentence for European and American interviewers who asked me to explain the terrible state of Nigeria. And here is the sentence. Nigeria was not set up to succeed but the extent of its failure is something Nigerians must take responsibility for. I mostly believe this, although I'm not sure what practical form take responsibility would, would take exactly. What is significant, though, is that whenever I say this, what invariably gets the focus is never the first part of the sentence about Nigeria not being set up to succeed, but the second part of that sentence about Nigerian responsibility. What the focus on the but does is this. It absolves. It frees Europe of responsibility, of a significant and traceable connection to the African present, and allows it the glow of charity. And I must add again that I am speaking of a general mainstream, since the far right is completely dismissive of any of this, and the far left is so tied up in knots about imperialism that they dare not have an opinion. And so here I mean the middle ground, the opinion that if people could vote on opinions would get the highest votes. 
I recently came across a statement made by a Dutch friend of a friend who said that although he loved African literature, he never gave African authors as gifts because according to him, people think you give a book like that because you feel some need to change how people think about Africa or because you want to make them aware of something important. And so although this person loved uh, African writers like Zig Simda and Chika Onigwe, he instead gave books by Philip Roth or J.M. Kutsia. Because according to him, I'm not a missionary. Books from or about Africa are read for a reason. One that often has nothing to do with the beauty of the language or the composition of the story. To the same extent, a lot of well-intended junk has been sold as art in recent decades in order to help those making it. Take a look up in your attic. You'll probably find a few examples. Ugly as sin, but buying it made you feel good. When I first read this, of course, I immediately and selfishly began to worry about all those lost book sales. But I thought to myself, how interesting that a person who likes African literature somehow doesn't want to be known for giving African books. Because Africa in the European imagination is a problem to be solved. And so to give a person a book is somehow to try and solve a problem. And it's even more interesting that uh, GM Kudzia, who is a white African, does not count, but that's another story. Well, my suggestion was that he give African books as presents, again, thinking about book sales, and that he write on the cover that the book has interesting sex scenes or violence. <laughs> The sort of things that are in those Scandinavian books that the whole world seems to be reading now. But his point, and it's an important one, was about this language of aid in Europe about Africa. A language so deeply ingrained that people will buy bad art to help Africa. But also at the same time somehow conveniently forget that Africa is full of good artists and good art. The present-day European story of Africa is a story of aid, of helping, but it is a story that is almost entirely divorced from the colonial past. And there is an acceptable language to tell this story. There is a manner of telling. Context is often ignored, or if it is included, it is done in a way that completely de-emphasizes it, a way that mentions it only to tick the box. It is as if to fully acknowledge that past would somehow be synonymous with being blamed personally for it. And so, this story emerges. Nothing wrong with Africa is our fault, but we must help out of the goodness of our hearts. And this, the ability to help Africa in many ways, becomes the measure of European humanity. What if I walked into an average classroom anywhere in Europe and asked the students what comes to mind when I say Africa? In addition to the usual war and poverty and aid, there is no doubt that charity of some sort would come to mind. If I asked those same students if there was some connection to their country and to this Africa, they would probably say no. They may very well gesture to something in the distant past, but which certainly has no real bearing on the present state of things. The past, after all, does not merely tell us what happened yesterday. It also illuminates what happens today. I remember my friend, the brilliant Kenyan writer, Binyavanga Wainaina, and I, once walking the streets of London some years ago, and as he walked past beautiful after beautiful building, he would point at one and say, this one was paid for by colonial loot from Kenya. And he would point at another and say, this one was paid for by colonial loot from Nigeria. It was funny and a bit exaggerated, but fundamentally not untrue. There is a link between the affluence of Europe and the poverty of Africa. Is it a simple, causative link? No. But I doubt that there is anything in human history that would yield simple, causative links. We humans seem to have more or less agreed that the nation state is how we want to organize ourselves how we want to protect our economic interests. But the very idea of the nation state is one that has taken hundreds of years and various failures to come close to functioning well. And even then, it never does so perfectly. And so, a Europe which tells itself that, say, the Enlightenment period, is closely connected to its present day institutions, a Europe which acknowledges that it took many, many years to impose taxes, to develop institutions that work, to create a collective idea of a nation state, 
will, however, curiously insist that European activities in Africa only 60 years ago no longer bear any significant relevance to the present day. There is a particular language used in saying this. A journalist in Denmark once asked me, who is to blame? Is it Africa or Europe? <laughs> and I wondered why the subject had to be so crudely reduced to this, a choice of two extremes. But it again seems fairly mainstream that the story of Europe in Africa is often debased and reduced to simple ideas of blame. But it has been 50 years, we hear often, they have had time to sort themselves out. We hear about terrible rulers who are corrupt in Africa, and in the end it is clear that Africa, of course, is entirely to blame. It has to be, in effect, so that the European self-assigned role of charity giver can thrive. The journalist in Denmark, I remember, told me that an average British or average Belgian or average Dutch could not be held responsible for what happened. And I wondered why it had become about the average Belgian and the average Dutch and the average British. What a strange thing to look at history in this way, as something from which one has to personally absolve oneself. Because of course nobody would suggest that the average Belgian struggling to find a job in Antwerp, for example, was personally responsible for the average Congolese struggling to find a meal in Kinshasa. But to acknowledge that just as the average Belgian can take ownership and pride in cultural institutions from a hundred years ago, just as the average French can take ownership of the ideals of the French Revolution, then the average European can surely acknowledge that the political inheritance in Congo today is fundamentally European. But the European story is that acknowledgement will complicate the easy sense of charity. And to further move away from a real engagement with its colonial past, there is often what I sometimes think of as the drawing up of the colonial balance sheet. So here again is Sarkozy. The colonizer came, he took, he helped himself, he exploited, he pillaged resources and wealth that did not belong to him. He stripped the colonized of his personality, of his liberty, of his land, of the fruit of his labor. The colonizer took, but I want to say with respect that he also gave. He built bridges, roads, hospitals, dispensaries, and schools. He turned virgin soil fertile. He gave up his effort, his work, his know-how. I want to say it here. Not all the colonialists were thieves or exploiters. Now, Sarkozy's glorious wisdom ends here. When I first read it, I thought about how France was occupied by Germany for five years, only five years, and in circumstances not at all as brutal as French colonization in North and West Africa. And it would be interesting to hear Sarkozy talk about the Nazis who had good intentions. I am personally sure that some Nazis had good intentions, simply because it is human nature. But it would be disingenuous of anyone to pick out the Nazis with good intentions, because it would seek <clears throat> to erase a general truth, which is this. A system of foreign domination is illegitimate and violent by its very nature, and it leaves long-reaching legacies behind. And that, it seems to me, is what this kind of balancing out of the subject of Europe, European colonialism in Africa seeks to do, to erase a general truth. There is also something simplistic about this idea. Yes, there were massacres, but roads were built. Yes, there was a plunder of natural resources, but railways were built. And somewhere in that balancing out, we forget that most of this infrastructure were in fact designed for the removal of resources in as quick and efficient manner as possible. Part of the balancing out also involves a kind of counter-history. It's either we are told, what would have been the alternative? One should not make a fuss, really, about colonialism, because things would have been worse for Africa if the Europeans hadn't sat down that cool day in 1884 in Berlin to share Africa. In some ways, it's like saying, <clears throat> and forgive the medical metaphor, this is what happens when you have a husband who's a doctor. It's like saying you have a stroke which has paralyzed half of your body, and you're told over and over that you can't really talk about it because you could have had metastatic pancreatic cancer instead. <laughs> 
or we are told that Africans, after all, helped in the enterprise of imperialism and slavery. And to quote the Senegalese historian Bubaka Boris Dub, never in the history of humanity has a nation oppressed another without the complicity, if not the zeal, of the elite of that conquered nation. And to that I would add that it does not even necessarily have to be the elite. Sometimes that complicity itself brings about the creation of a new elite. And according to Robert Paxton, who worked on Vichy, France, Adolf Hitler was not particularly interested in occupying the whole of France. He just wanted to neutralize the country and turn it into an aerial base. It was in fact the French state authorities who urged him to do more. But this kind of counter-history or balancing out strategies are really about erasing history. And this erasure is necessary if Europe's view of itself as a charity giver is to succeed. To talk about colonialism in its fullness is to risk talking about structures that contribute to poverty in Africa. And so, to avoid talking about structures, the discourse often then suggests that the problems in Africa are somehow atavistic or even genetic. When I first read Sarkozy's speech, I got to the point where he said that Africa's reality is that of a great continent that has everything to succeed but does not. And I thought that he would say that Africa is not able to succeed because of its bad leaders, which seems to be a fairly common and acceptable thing to say. But I was very amused to read that in Sarkozy's esteemed view, Africa does not succeed because it cannot free itself of its myths. I laughed, and then I began to try and figure out just how myths had caused the fall of oil prices, which deeply affected a country like mine that is blindly enthralled to its oil exports. I began to try and understand how myths had contributed to trade tariffs, how myths had contributed to ineffective leadership, to men who have ruled African countries as horrible dictators after colonial rule, which of course was itself also a dictatorship. But the idea of the atavistic, the reduction of a people to a sort of primitive and spiritual nature in the political discourse of Africa is alarmingly common. Here is some more from Sarkozy. Youth of Africa, don't listen to those who want to deprive you of your roots and your identity, who want to erase all that is African, all the mystique, the religiousness, the sensitivity, the African mentality. In general, it is Africa as nature, as in tune with nature, as mystical, and related to these as almost animalistic, but in a good way, sometimes even in an admiring way, because it comes from the mouth of friends, as Sokozi, for example, is a friend of Africa. And speaking of friends, and this time I mean friend not in quote, I asked a dear and brilliant friend, again, real friend, not in quote, who is Norwegian and an avid watcher of culture, how Norway sees Africa as I was preparing to come here. And he told me about a Norwegian TV show in which the point was to scientifically prove the idea of the black African as genetically less intelligent than other races. And this is a bit of what he told me, and I quote from his email. And then comes the question many people impose, but the stupid TV guy actually dared ask. Is it not all about black people being stupid? The variation over this theme is this. Africa is nature, sex and lust, rhythm and spirituality. Happy smiling faces, not bothering about modern stuff and wealth. If we, we being Europeans, have done something wrong, it is mostly becoming modern that is our sin. We spend too much money, are too rich, have too big cars and have lost touch with nature. While you Africans, we envy your closeness to nature, to history, to family, and your ability to dance and be happy without having a washing machine and a TV. And the first thing I thought was, I know many, many people in Nigeria who actually do want to have a washing machine. But and so as if Sarkozy had watched this Norwegian TV show, here is a line from Sarkozy's speech. I have come to tell you that you don't have to be ashamed of the values of African civilization, 
that they do not drag you down but elevate you, that they are an antidote to the materialism and the individualism that enslave modern man, that they are the most precious of legacies against the dehumanization of the world. I have come to tell you that modern man who experiences the need to reconcile himself with nature has much to learn from the African because the African has lived in a symbiotic relationship with nature for thousands of years. Now, not that living with nature is a bad thing, but the overemphasis on this is a way of not only explaining the poverty, but of doing it without having to fully acknowledge the role of Europe. It is a narrative to, that leaves only two choices, either pity or contempt, and both can come wrapped in a friendly voice. Sarkozy also says, and this was the part of the speech that seemed to receive the most outrage, at least from the people who forwarded it to me. The tragedy of Africa is that the African has not fully entered into history. It is interesting in thinking about ideas of history that a speech that is itself actively erasing history is doing so by appealing to history and to Africa's failure to enter history. But what does it mean to say that Africa has not fully entered into history. Sarkozy explains it like this. The African peasant, who for thousands of years has lived according to the seasons, whose life ideal was to be in harmony with nature, only knew the eternal renewal of time, rhythmed by the endless repetition of the same gestures and the same words. In this imaginary world where everything starts over and over again, there is no place for human adventure or for the idea of progress. The problem of Africa, and allow a friend of Africa to say it, is to be found here. Africa's challenge is to enter to a greater extent into history. And finally, Sarkozy tells us, the Muslim civilization, Christianity, and colonization, beyond the crimes and the mistakes that were committed in their name, have opened the African heart and mentality to the universal and to history. So in summary, according to the French president, everything worthwhile in Africa is of foreign origin. And this itself is a very old idea that has its roots in the justification for imperialism. But in thinking of Sarkozy's peasant, for example, I think of my aunt, who is a farmer in my ancestral hometown, and who complains often about how she cannot afford the chemical fertilizers that will give her better yields, and how the government doesn't have subsidies for fertilizers, and how foreign companies don't give discounts. And then I wonder about Sarkozy's speech. Does my aunt actually exist? Some years ago, I came across an interview with the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Abuja, Nigeria's capital, and I was struck by this anecdote from him. I arrive in Cologne as the Archbishop of Abuja, and I want to meet the Archbishop of Cologne. The question I ask myself is, am I going to meet a brother Archbishop? Theoretically and theologically, of course I am. We are both successors of the apostles. We are both in charge of a whole group of Christ's faithful. But when I arrive in Cologne, I have to pass through the whole bureaucracy of the archdiocese before I can get an appointment to see the archbishop, if, if I am lucky to get one. That already confuses the whole situation. So according to this archbishop, church leaders in the West tend to look at developing countries as problems to be solved rather than as partners in a search for solutions. But the archbishop was also very quick to make clear that this was a two-way street. He said this about some African church leaders. Some of my colleagues in the church go all over the place talking in very subdued tones, painting a picture of a poor Africa that is totally helpless. They tell long stories of war and the need to help us, and sometimes they even exaggerate how bad things are in order to squeeze out a bit of water from the stony hearts of those to whom they are talking. Finally, the archbishop so he's asked a question about, you know, usually again, the question of what's the answer, explain it, tell us. And he says that the European church leaders should look at Africa, that it's, it's natural for the bishops of the Western world to be concerned about what's happening in the poorer countries and to listen to the link between their affluence and our poverty. There is a link. And it is the job of the church all over the world to see how we can do something about this anomaly. <laughs>
But we must do this as brothers and sisters in, our, in one church, not as patrons in the West confronting objects of charity. And finally, thinking of charity makes me think of privilege. I remember the first time an American friend told me that I was one of those privileged Africans. And I was taken aback because I had never thought of myself as privileged. To me, privileged were those Nigerians who, as children, went abroad every summer and who had drivers designated the children's driver. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was privileged and that there are different meanings and layers of privilege. My family was far from wealthy, but we were the academic middle class, and this meant that I had the good fortune of a good education, of growing up in a house with books, of being raised by parents who were themselves educated. It meant that I was given the basic tools to navigate life in the modern world. Some of my cousins had this kind of access as well, but some, on the other hand, were not given those tools. They did not go to good schools because their parents were not educated and sometimes could not afford the schools and did not have education as a high priority. Like many African families, mine is extended and the side of the family that has a bit more subsidizes the side that has a bit less. So my parents paid school fees for a number of cousins and now I send money to my cousins and my aunts and my uncles. And there are times when I have had to remind myself that because I can send them money or because I can speak English better than they can and because I'm able to understand the structural setup of the modern world does not make me morally or metaphysically better than them. The wonderful South African writer Nadine Kodima, who is white, writes about what she calls the great South African lie of white superiority. We whites have the better part of everything. And it is difficult for us not to feel, somewhere secretly, that we are better. It is very easy to become so entrenched in our privilege that we are blind to it. Now, I'm not here to say that we are all the same or that we all have the same abilities, because obviously we do not. Although it is true that for every person who has attained a position of privilege, there are many others who would have done the same if they had been given the opportunities. Acknowledging the ways in which we are privileged and the ways in which that privilege complicates our charity is very important. If I constantly give my cousins money with no prospect of their ever earning that money themselves, I sometimes wonder whether at some point it becomes about my own goodness. And in much the same way, I sometimes wonder whether there are people who need Africa to be poor not consciously wanting it, of course, but a more metaphysical need, because only if Africa is poor can they then have a chance to demonstrate their own goodness, a goodness that is often unreflective. Finally, I would like to end with a story about Nigerian defensiveness. Now, among Nigerians, complaining about our problems is an art form. Most conversations quickly become a litany of complaints about government corruption, light, water, roads, schools. But if a European were to say the same things exactly, to recite the same litany of complaints, Nigerians become defensive, sometimes angrily so. I have always been curious about this brand of defensiveness, which I myself often exhibit, by the way. It seems to me that we have it because we assume that the complaining Nigerian is aware that Nigeria is not only about its problems, is aware of the human complexity, knows of the intelligence and ingenuity of people, knows how they cry and laugh, knows what motivates them and what they aspire to and what they find meaningful. And we suspect that the European, entrenched in a view of us as needers of charity, does not know these other stories about us, and so we bristle about being defined solely by what we do not have and what we are not. And then our defensiveness emerges. Now I am sure that <coughs> there are ways in which this defensiveness can be re reduced. And I am sure that there are many Europeans who do, not, who do want to talk about Europe's colonial past in its fullness. Who do not want to, who, who, I'm sorry. I am sure that there are many Europeans who do want to talk of Europe's colonial past in more detail who want to speak of it as a whole, who do not want to erase. But I think it is time for those people to be more mainstream.
I think it is time for them to represent the stories that Europe tells itself about its colonial past. Thank you.